So let me get a feel for uh, the experience level of people out here. How many people have flown quite a bit in the backcountry? Okay, fair amount. Uh, how many people have not but are interested in flying in the backcountry? Okay, a little more there. So I'd say it's almost like two-thirds are kind of interested and a third have already been there. So for the third that have already been there and done that, I'm going to rely on you to help me through this presentation as we talk through some of the ideas and the concepts of flying in the backcountry because it's quite different. And um, I'm sharing with you on the screen this coalition that AOPA put together because we noticed last year there were a fair amount of mishaps happening in the backcountry. And we've actually noticed that this segment of general aviation is a growing segment of general aviation. In some cases, depending on kind of how you look and measure, it's the fastest growing segment that we're seeing. And the exciting part is it's bringing in new faces to aviation, people that haven't flown before, and it's bringing in uh, younger people and the demographics that have typically been underrepresented in general aviation. So, for example, females. You see, as a percentage of people flying in the backcountry, a higher percentage of female pilots than you do in the general general aviation population. So we're excited about the whole backcountry initiative. We're excited about the things you can do in your airplane. Um, what we want to do is help people see how challenging this can be and the kind of preparation that you need to get back there. So this, all these organizations that you see here have been working with us since about October. Since about October of last year, we've been working on ways that we can improve our outreach to help uh, talk about uh, backcountry safety. So let's get into the discussion a little bit, and I want to start off with a video that kind of uh, sets the stage for the inspiration. So if we could, Philip, play that. Oh, I can do it. Look at you, Philip the Magician. Thanks, buddy. So um, this, is a, this is just a little video clip of uh, coming out of uh, Marble Creek in, um, in uh, Idaho. It'll take a little bit to catch up. And it'll just kind of set the stage of uh, why do you fly in the back country? And the primary reason I can tell you that I enjoy it so much is you can access places that the only way to get there is either by hiking, horseback, or aviation. In many of these strips, wheeled vehicles are not allowed whatsoever except for airplanes. They even mow the strips with mule-drawn uh, mowers, if you will. So if you take your bicycle out, they'll ask you to put your bicycle back in your airplane. So, they're pretty uh, phenomenal places. You can see some spectacular things, and it is uh, very challenging and very demanding flying. And there's a lot in uh, that video, too, that we'll break down a little bit later in the things that you're working on and the things that you're thinking about when you're flying in the backcountry. So, um, so let's take, a, let's take a look at, to start with, the big concept is be prepared, be ready when you go into the back country. Realize that you're in a very different environment than you're here in the front country. There's no kind of infrastructure there to help you out. There's often no people to help you out. You know, if you're in sort of the front country, if you will, if you have a flat tire or you have a dead battery or you have, you know, whatever issue, you can generally knock around the airport and find somebody to give you a ride or somebody to help you out with your airplane. At least that's been my experience. Not so in the backcountry. So you need to think of yourself as kind of self-sustaining. You're really kind of on your own back there. And as a pilot, it's really important that you're aware of your own personal skills and limitations. So here's a challenge. I won't do this in public, but if I were to ask you how many pilots in this room are above average, 100% of the hands would go up, right? Because we all think we're above average. Statistically, that doesn't play out, right? So my point is, it's really hard for us to do assessment of what our true capabilities are. When you head into the backcountry in some of these demanding places, what you're gonna find is that inflated assessment can really be punishing. So it's really important that you have a full awareness of what your skills are. And we'll talk about some of those skills a little bit and aware of uh, your airplane and some of its limitations. So some airplanes are purpose-built for the backcountry. I personally own and fly a Super Cub. It's one of the best airplanes you can fly in the backcountry, but it's certainly not the only one. A 182 uh, with big tires on it is a fantastic backcountry airplane. Can get in and out just about every place I can go, really, and carry a lot more fuel, a lot more people, and a lot more equipment. 
great airplanes, those two, a nose wheel airplane and a tail dragger. If you go moving off that scale, there are some airplanes that just simply aren't built to go back in the back country. And sometimes pilots find out the hard way that um, they're in too deep when they get back there. The kind of airplanes I'm talking about is airplanes with uh, small prop clearance, for example, have a really tough time in the back country. None of these strips are going to be prepared and maintained at any level that you're used to. There are oftentimes undulating strips. There's oftentimes rocks and um, big kind of loose gravel and stuff. So um, you have to make sure that you're flying the right airplane and that that airplane is prepared to go in the back country. Now, having said that, there's a lot of strips back there that are perfectly OK for Moonies and Navions and Bonanzas. Um, but that kind of comes in the preparation of the environment piece, which is this next one. What you're oftentimes going into, and whether this is the backcountry of Tennessee or the more dramatic backcountry of uh, Idaho, you're going into a place where the environment can punish you if you go in not appreciating and respecting it. The winds uh, and turbulence are the two biggest factors that I find when we get back there. And then uh, we've, you got to find out that uh, are, are you prepared with your aircraft to operate within that environment with the equipment that you need and the personal uh, and the personal equipment that you need. So let's start out with this uh, honest uh, skills assessment. And I want to play for you a video of uh, landing. Um, I think this landing is going to be um, at Cougar Ranch. I'm not, I'm not real sure. I think it's, no, actually, this one is at a place called uh, Soldier Field in Idaho. Anybody familiar with it? Yep. Anybody? Yep. So, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the skills in this, this honest skills assessment. So let's, let's uh, watch this video. And I'll describe it as we're coming in. So this is a long downwind. What you'll often find in the canyons in Idaho is there is no such thing as a standard pattern. You're oftentimes flying very long downwinds. You'll go blind to the airfield, and you have to figure out when to turn your base turn based on where there's a gap or maybe an incoming stream to that, to that primary canyon you're on. Most of the time, you land upstream, most of the time. And then. Um, once you find that place where you can descend, oftentimes when you get back here in the backcountry, you, you are now committed to a landing of some type. A lot of times when you get in these uh, deeper canyons in Idaho and Montana, some of them in Arkansas and Bentonville, um, you're, you're on one-way strips. And at some point, you are committed to put your aircraft on that field in one way or another. So you've got to be comfortable flying tight to the canyons. You got to be comfortable slowing down and configuring really early. I'm probably flying about 50 miles an hour here. If we had the uh, audio on, you'd probably hear me in and out of the stall horn. And look on the far end of that strip. You can see where that canyon comes together, which is what makes this strip tricky. I want to say it's 1,200, maybe 1,500 feet. But the winds come howling through that canyon, and they can really be tricky. In this case, they weren't. It was a very calm day. It was a relatively uh, light and easy day to go into uh, Soldier Bar. If you take a look at the runway there, you'll see that it undulates. And so I know from talking to the locals that one of the things that you want to do is make sure you land before or after those undulating hills because they're going to launch you back airborne again. So the skills that I'm talking about there to feel comfortable with and to give you an idea of kind of what my personal preparation to fly back there, uh, I've got about um, probably about 5,000 total hours, a little more than that actually. And in the Super Cub, um, I've got probably uh, about three to 400 hours, I think, in this Super Cub. Leading up to going into the backcountry, I would go out two or three times a week, and I would work on my spot landings to be within 50 feet of the spot that I wanted to be, within really about 10 feet either side of center line, and um, a lot of slow flight drills. So I would take this airplane up and slow fly it in every condition, no flap, partial flap, full flap, as much weight as I could get on it at full gross weight, and then come in and out of the, uh, in and out of the stall regime and flat stalls and turning stalls. And if you're going to go into the backcountry, you have to be completely comfortable in that environment. Slow flighting, stalling, in and out of stalls, feeling how your airplane drifts back and forth. There's, a, uh, there's an exercise uh, that I like to do called a drift exercise when I... Um, I taught my uh, daughter to solo in our Super Cub, and I, and I give my son a check out in the Super Cub. And if you're flying a tailwheel, one of the best things you can do to help you understand the dynamics of a tailwheel is a drift exercise. So you fly down the center of the runway, and if I'm in the back seat typically, I will usually call this out, 
and I want the pilot to stabilize just barely above touchdown. In fact, if they touch down, I'm okay with that. You're at just above touchdown speed, and I'll ask them to drift to the left center of the runway and stabilize, get the fuselage straight. Drift to the right center of the runway and stabilize, fuselage straight. They're only a few feet off the ground. They're just barely above stall speed, trying to manage power as they go into a bank and pull power out as they come out of the bank. It's one of the best exercises you can do, and every now and then you'll find that you'll touch down there, and that's, that's perfectly okay. It's one of the best exercises you can do to work on controlling your airplane at, um, at very slow speed, which is a critical skill in the backcountry. So um, the first step I would suggest is for the people who have not been in the backcountry, and this actually works if you haven't been in a while, this past year was about my third or maybe my fourth year flying in the backcountry, and every year that I go out there, I start with a ride with an instructor, with somebody that I really respect. A lot of times, uh, my friend Mike Vivian, who runs the Montana Pilots Association, is a very highly experienced backcountry pilot. I'll ask him to sit in my back seat and go back out and do some stalls, do some landings, do some canyon turns. So my strong recommendation to you is if, you, if you're looking at going into the backcountry, start with one of the, the and, and not any CFI will do. You need to find a, a backcountry experienced certified flight instructor to go fly with. So that would be step one if you've never been and you want to go. You can find them on the web. Pretty soon AOPA will have a website up where we'll be able to help you find those kind of instruction. Um, this book here is written by uh, some friends and colleagues, Amy Hoover and Dick Williams. This is a fantastic book in helping you kind of understand the backcountry, the awareness piece. And they also give you some ideas on the skills you're going to need and the exercises to run. So we talked about all that and uh, spot landings, high density altitude operations. And I'll show a video here that kind of illustrates that in just a little bit. Um, every landing you do is a short and a soft field landing. Every single one of them. Every single takeoff you do is a short and a soft field uh, takeoff. And so actually the easier part of that is it's for real. You know when we practice that in sort of the front country, if you will, Sometimes it's hard to do because you're kind of making it up and you don't get punished by not executing it right. You'll be punished by not executing those things right here in the backcountry. So let's talk about uh, your aircraft and some of the awareness there. So I talked a little bit about the kind of airplanes that work and their skills and their limitations. So it's really important that you understand your performance characteristics and that you, have, uh, you either have your POH or you have booklets that help you out with the kind of takeoff performance and landing performance that you can expect. Most of the time, obviously, you're dealing with uh, takeoff performance because, quite frankly, usually, you can get in more places than you can get out. If I were to ask you um, stalls and loss of control, for example, do you think, how many people in the room think that stalls and loss of control are more of an issue and happen more frequently in the landing phase of flight? Oh, come on, you guys are too smart. Or you've been reading my material. That's what it is. The reality is, we published a uh, paper on stalls. We analyzed over 2,000 stalls in the Air Safety Institute. And of those stalls that we analyzed, uh, overwhelmingly, most stalls happen on takeoff and go around. Takeoff, departure, and go around. And that is very definitely the case uh, in the, uh, in the backcountry. Because what happens is, this is a typical mishap scenario in the backcountry. Somebody flies into a place like Sulphur Creek. I won't get it exactly right, but off the top of my head, I think Sulphur Creek is something like 4,000 feet long. Um, and the density altitude, I want to say, is up around 5,500, maybe 6,000 feet. So they fly in for breakfast. The landing's relatively easy. It is a one-way strip. They go in and have breakfast, and they start just kind of lollygagging and talking to friends and viewing airplanes and all that. Meanwhile, the temperature's going up and up and up. And then here come the winds down the canyon. It's a one-way strip. So now you've got a high density altitude and a downwind takeoff, and those are your only options. And somebody's, you know, that strip, you can go into that strip in a bonanza. Um, you can go into, you know, all kinds of different airplanes will access that strip. But you can't take off from that strip in a bonanza or a heavier airplane in the afternoon with downwind uh, winds coming down the canyon with an uphill takeoff. And there have been many people that have tried that and realized the hard way that you, you can't do it. So um, that's one of the things to make sure you understand are the limitations of your airplanes. So I mentioned I have one of the best airplanes you can use in the backcountry, which is a Super Cub. However, my Super Cub's 150 horsepower. 
And I'm here to tell you, at 150 horsepower, when you're at 6,000 feet and the temperature rises and now you're dealing with 9,000 feet density altitude, you can really feel the limitations of 150 horsepower. It takes me three to four times longer on a takeoff roll, and my climb is sometimes a couple hundred feet a minute. So um, it's really important that you understand that and that you can apply that to how density altitude is going to impact you. So um, let's watch this little video on aircraft awareness, and, uh, and I want to uh, talk to you about this. This is, this is a classic case. So the first thing to notice here is I'm flying with a, a, uh, a group in the backcountry. I never refer to it as formation flying in the backcountry because I really don't believe you're flying formation. You are flying as a group and a coordinated group sometimes, and in my mind a group should not be more than three. It's simply too tight to be back there. There is no time for radio chatter. Everybody who flies um, in the backcountry, and this is typically on the East Coast too, where you're talking the mountains of Tennessee or Arkansas or Montana or Idaho, Utah and, and all the places, 122.9 is the common freak. Everybody chats in just about every strip, in every canyon on 122.9. So you don't have a lot of time to talk among your formation there. You're only talking, or your group, you're only talking about uh, critical items that you want to discuss. So um, here's a case where really hot day. Um, I think this is a, a um, I actually think this is at um, Soldier Bar also, the takeoff. Um, it might have been at Cougar Ranch, actually. But the problem is now I'm number three in the takeoff and because I'm the slowest. And typically, as the slowest, I like to go last because I don't want guys to worry about running up on me. And I don't want to have to worry about them running up on me. So the faster airplanes take off first. And now really hot, really still air. And the first thing you'll notice is I'm having to sit there and just wait for that uh, dust to dissipate because it was almost a zero-zero takeoff. I was almost like IMC. I couldn't see. Then the next thing you'll notice on this is the mistake I make on departure is I'm following two Super Cubs at 180 horsepower. They'll take off and they end up turning uh, back up river and uh, we're going to go up river to a different strip. And I try to follow them through that takeoff. Now I've been, I've been following them around you know, this morning for more than an hour or so. So I know the limitations. They're 180 horsepower, I'm 150 horsepower. So I've been careful about that. But this density altitude and the performance of the airplane slips my mind or I don't quite fully assess it here. And you'll see me uh, make a turn. And it doesn't, it doesn't really get uh, concerning in terms of scary, but it gets concerning to me in terms of that was a much more degraded performance than I thought I would have. And you'll see me fly by kind of the Mahoney strip that sits right up from uh, Cougar Ranch there. So that's what you'll see on this, on this takeoff. And it's fairly common. It's, there's a little bit of curve in this. It's a, down wheel, it's a downhill takeoff. Um, and then you'll see the, uh, the canyons in the distance. Really still air, and it's a high density altitude, so I don't want any turbulence in the air. So I paused also for the visibility and to let the, uh, let the vortices move out of the way. So I don't know how well you can see it in the distance, but once you get airborne and good flying speed, one of the things you do in canyon flying is you move over to the side of the canyon. You never fly down the middle of a canyon. You're moving over to the side to, to make sure you have all that turning room in case you ever need it. So I'm moving over to the far side of the canyon, and then I'll try to make my turn back because I didn't want to be too far and trail these guys. And you can see that, I don't know how well you can tell it, but that is about the max climb performance I can get out of that Super Cub. It's less than half fuel. It's only me in it. And um, that's about the max performance you can get out of, out of that kind of density altitude. It's probably, probably around 9,000 feet density altitude. And you can see there's the Mahoney strip. So it was just closer than I thought it was going to be. And it kind of illustrates how difficult it is to assess the impact of that density altitude on the performance of your airplane. So um, let's talk a little bit about aircraft preparation. So um, when you take your aircraft back there, it's really important to realize there is, no, there is no infrastructure. This is why I also advocate that you go with a friend. So flying back, one of the reasons I like a group of three flying in the back country 
is you have two other people or two other airplanes to help you out if somebody needs to go get either medical attention or somebody needs to go get a part or fuel or your airplane's done, you're going to tie it down and you need a flight, you know, you need a ride out of the backcountry. So just realize there's a lot of people that do fly solo back there. I've certainly done it myself and going to places and camp for the night. But just realize that's a slightly elevated risk profile when you go by yourself because you've got no help uh, if something should go wrong. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that your airplane is in good mechanical condition when you go in the backcountry. So I can tell you, flying over those uh, locations, again, almost no matter where, Arkansas, Tennessee, the same way, you'll fly over some country that's really remote. You know, you'll find yourself thinking, I, I, you know, I don't ever want my engine to quit, but I really don't want it to quit right now because there's no good options of places uh, for me to look at. So um, making sure that your oil has changed, for example, on time, you know, any, any kind of that timing stuff that's going to come up, you, want, you just want to take care of that. Um, spare parts and tools. So uh, I can tell you that uh, inner tubes are a big thing. You'll find uh, those, those runways are not maintained. So whether it's cactus or whatever the case is, um, it's relatively, I don't want to say it's common, but um, you know, tailwheel flats uh, is just, it's just a thing that you may have to deal with. So having the ability to have an extra tube and the tools on hand to change a tailwheel or change a tube uh, is pretty valuable, for example. Um, having some kind of backup battery, a lot of people will bring kind of solar power batteries, if you will, to help power, you know, if they forget. If you do dumb things like you forget and leave your battery on, for example, you know, you can always hand prop if you have somebody to help you. But those kinds of things. I had a friend one time who was telling me a story that he took his keys out and he put them in his fishing vest and he went fishing and he dropped his keys in the stream. And, uh, you know, his airplane's back, back <laughs> up, up at the place there, but his, his keys are gone. He said, I was so lucky that, you know, he's fishing in a pretty deep pool and he was able to uh, fish around and finally find them. It took him about an hour or so, but he finally found his keys down there. So having a spare set of keys, you know, just those kind of things. Uh, those kind of little bitty things can sneak up on you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the environment. I spoke some about that, but I want to chat with you about it a little bit more in terms of uh, the awareness of what you're getting into. If you were to be able to deal with the top two in this list, then you'd be doing great and you'd be hitting the primary issues of concern for you, and that is density, altitude, and winds. When you get into the mountains, uh, especially the larger the mountains, the more this is the case, what you'll find in the afternoons is as the winds start to blow and as the temperature starts to pick up, now you're dealing with thermal turbulence and you're also dealing with wind turbulence coming through those canyons, which can really wreak havoc. I mean, it does really strange things. It's very difficult to predict. If you, um, if you find your, a scenario where the winds are kind of tricky and you ask a local, well, should I fly, go up, climb on top of the peaks, or should I stay and hide down in the valleys, you know, to get away from the wind? They kind of look at you and go, it just depends. It just depends on the winds and how you're feeling, and they'll oftentimes tell you, go try both. Most of the experienced people that fly back here a lot, they fly really early in the morning, and they're down by about 10.30 or 11, and they're done. Every now and then you can fly really late, in the afternoon or the early evening, but that's only about an hour window before sun goes down because what happens is as that air starts to cool off, it starts to drop that heavy air, and now that heavy air starts flowing through the canyons and creates a whole different dynamic. So for my purposes, when I'm back here and most of the experienced people, they will plan on all their flying to happen and be done by 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock a.m. And that way, you know, the whole density altitude thing, as it starts to rise, they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about the winds. And quite frankly, it just takes all the fun out of it when you're worried about whether or not your airplane has the performance you need and you're just getting bounced around, you know, through thermal, thermal and wind turbulence anyway. There's just no fun in that. So dealing with density altitude is something that the Air Safety Institute is going to be working hard, not just for backcountry, but other kinds of flying, because it's such a difficult concept for us to visualize how your aircraft can perform in those kind of conditions. Um, and I mentioned, you know, uh, there is no infrastructure. There is no typical approach and departure routing. Every airstrip is the same because you're typically following canyons. The most common approach is you fly overhead. It's not uncommon to see wind socks at either end of the field, and they're giving you exact opposite information, right? And that's because of the way the winds kind of come through the canyon. And so what you have to decide usually is not which direction you're going to land because that's typically given. 
most of these strips, or certainly a lot of them, are one way in. And if the winds don't favor that, you just simply don't land there that day. And so um, not having that approach, not having the typical approach and departure routing, having to think through that and plan that on your own. And I don't mean to be making this sound more difficult than it is. You can certainly do all this. I mean, I did it. But um, it takes work, and it takes planning, and it takes a lot of study. And if you put that preparation in, you're going to have an enjoyable experience in the backcountry and see some phenomenal places and do some flying like you've never done before. You know, I, I, I was a former uh, jet pilot in the military, and I get asked all the time, you know, how can you go from flying the speed of sound and, um, you know, having all that power, the snap of your wrist, you get afterburner power, to flying a 100 mile an hour, 150 horsepower Super Cub? And at least part of the answer is the mental work in flying in the backcountry like this and flying that limited power Super Cub is, uh, is demanding. And I just enjoy the challenge of doing that. Aside from this, the plain pure fun of flying it. So um, also realize there's no outside communication there. So most of the time, you will want to carry an in-reach satellite device. Uh, I think Garmin sells them. There's probably some others. A personal locator device is a good idea. The rescue forces will tell you if you have a personal locator device, they can come to within feet of your location. If you're relying on an ELT, it's sometimes miles away. They have a very difficult time if, if they're monitoring it to begin with and if they have the equipment on board to come after you. So don't rely on an ELT. Most people that fly in the backcountry will fly with a vest on of uh, equipment that you might need. There's, a, there's kind of a, a common saying, survival equipment is what you have on your body. Anything else in the back of the airplane is camping gear. So anything you might need immediately in an emergency. And the best thing to do is go down to Orvis and buy their cheapest uh, fly fishing vest you can get. They're fantastic. They got all kind of pockets all over them. And there's a bunch of material in that uh, backcountry safety book I mentioned about what to stuff inside that vest. So here's a little bit about environment awareness. Um, and we'll watch this video. And here's another case where this is an example of a one-way strip, also an example of just some of the beauty that you can go experience back there. This is uh, Big Creek um, down uh, uh, in Idaho. And what you're going to, this is, I think it starts with either downwind or maybe I'm on base here. And then as your turn final, you'll see that there's a point, and I'll try to uh, point it out, where um, there is no go around. So at, at this point, I'm now committed, one way or the other, this airplane is going on the ground. And that's a concept you have to get used to uh, flying in the backcountry. So the typical way that I've learned and I like to fly patterns back here is I'll slow and fully configure on the latter part of my downwind. So right about here, I'm flying somewhere around 55 miles an hour, my Super Cub fully configured, all flaps down. One of the hardest things to do is to get low enough, slow enough in time to make the, uh, the runway. A lot of the backcountry mishaps we see are due to that. They come in too high and too fast. They're on a one-way strip, and they got no way to dissipate the altitude and the airspeed. So to try to eliminate that, I like to get low early, and I like to uh, get slow early. You're typically flying about maybe 400 feet patterns. So you can't quite see the airfield. It'll be coming into view here in just a little bit. Um, but right about here, now I'm committed. One way or another, I don't have enough room to turn around in this canyon. One way or another, the airplane's going on the ground. That's a, that's a whole mental process to be, uh, to be ready for. One of the traps is, you see it, you, you're probably thinking, well, why can't you just go up there to the right down that canyon? That's a box canyon. There's no way I would outclimb that in a Super Cub. Here's another example of the environment that I want to share with you, and that is when you're looking at the terrain and looking at the mountains. So I mentioned you usually don't ever fly down the center of a canyon. You're flying on one side or the other for a very specific purpose. All things being equal, if there's uh, no other reason to do so, you'll fly down the right side of the canyon, rules of the road, because somebody else might be coming up the left side of the canyon, right? So all things being equal. Most of the time what you're going to find are there are some winds that are going to favor you on one side of the canyon or another. In the, in the uh, sort of dramatic hills of Montana and Idaho, 
you don't want to be on the uh, downwind side of uh, one of those canyons because uh, the downward drafts coming off those mountains um, can be strong enough to where they exceed your ability to climb out of them. On the other side of the canyon, you'll find some really good lift uh, on the upwind side of the canyon. So a lot of times you're deciding which side of the canyon you want to fly on based on where the winds are coming from. So a little bit more about uh, the environment and, and preparing yourself there. So if you're going to go into uh, Idaho or Montana specifically, um, there are some fantastic resources uh, for you to go look at. And I, w I simply would not go back there without looking at these resources. Um, there's an app, uh, Idaho, uh, Idaho Division of Avionics or Idaho Aviation Association, I think, puts out. You can download that app. Um, and it has these kind of guides on it for all the airfields you're going to. It'll tell you whether or not it's one way. It'll tell you how to fly your patterns a lot and the, you know, the, the, uh, some of the nuances of uh, flying these fields. It's so important that you go to these sites before you go back here. So study it before you go. And on every airport you think you're going to go to, download these guides and take a look at them. There's a, a ton of helpful information. So in summary, I think backcountry flying is some of the most exciting flying you can do. It is really uh, spectacular. You can get to places that that's the only way you can access these magnificent places. The payoff for that is you're going to be punished if you go in unprepared. And if you go in over assessing your skills and your ability, then you're going to be punished for that as well. So the payoff for going to see some places that most humans don't get to see, quite frankly, is that um, you have to be ready for it. Your equipment has to be ready, and you have to be ready, and you have to be honest with yourself about your assessment and your abilities to fly back here. So um, I want to thank uh, all of these people. All of these people have been working with me since October or before on how we can get the word out about come to the back country. It is great, exciting flying. You should come back there. You should come back there if you're prepared to come back there. And so that's the message I think that each one of these people would have for you if you were to talk to them. Each one of them works for uh, either they're on their own or they're on a, they have a website with uh, fantastic information. I strongly encourage you to go there. And uh, I'll leave it here. Everything the Air Safety Institute does is funded through the foundation. So if you're a foundation supporter, thank you for that. And we'd like you to, uh, to join us if you can and help us uh, do more of the safety work that we do.